Today's show is sponsored by Essentia Analytics, an award-winning fintech company that provides AI-driven behavioral analytics services to professional investors and allocators of capital. Essentia works with leading active equity investment teams to measure, improve, and promote their decision-making skill and helps asset owners and allocators assess portfolio managers based on demonstrated investment skill, not just past performance. To learn more about their revolutionary approach to unlocking behavioral alpha in active equity management, visit Essentia-Analytics.com. Welcome to the Compounders Podcast. On this show, we explore the topic of compounding from various angles, including through interviews with public and private company executives, investors who focus on compounders, and newer investment firms that are building a business they hope will become more valuable over time. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of SNN or its affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. My guest on the show today is Nick King, the co-founder and CEO of Vint. Through Vint, Nick is on a mission to turn wine into a financial asset class. Nick was working on the buy side at a value investment firm, but left to work on Vint full-time in 2021. Since then, the company has gone through a rigorous SEC registration process and is now in position to offer investors the ability to participate in the returns that come from owning wine. With that as a backdrop, I was eager to talk to Nick about the structural inefficiencies in wine pricing that can lead to attractive returns, where an investment in wine fits within a broader portfolio, the different strategies that Vint offers, how his experience as a professional investor has impacted the way he manages Vint, and whether or not Vint benefits from being a first mover in the space. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with Vint CEO, Nick King. Nick, you've talked about how you went uh, about starting Vint the wrong way. You've also highlighted how you think business school students are taught the wrong things about entrepreneurship. Can you discuss how you would do it differently if you could do it over? Absolutely. Um, What is really relevant to this is about two months ago, I was down at Emory in their business school um, teaching, uh, uh, lecturing about wine and spirits as an asset class. Um, They have a a really interesting course on illiquid assets um, that I got to know the professor. And I I asked him if I could talk about entrepreneurship as well for part of the class is something that I'm I'm very passionate about. And he said, of course, Um, the way that I started that section is, I asked the class, let's start a business. What's the first thing that you should do? Um, And I I had this this thesis that they were going to to list, um, you know, the the common, but in my opinion, the the wrong things to start. So I get, you need a business license, you create a business plan, um, you have to go and raise money, you come up with a name. um, And that's exactly what I got. And I, I actually list the 10 steps listed by the, the small business uh, administration, the SBA, on how to start a business. And it was almost word for word what is taught in business school. Um, that's exactly what I did when I started Vint. Um, coming from the, the value investment world, um, I, I went and I explored wine and spirits. I wrote a business plan. Um about how I think it's a um, an inefficient market. I raised some money, came up with a name. I did um, all of these things. Um, and, and what I didn't do and what people don't realize is ultimately you need customers for any business that you're going to start. So um, it's something that is totally neglected in how entrepreneurship is, is taught in in most instances um and you know from my own perspective i did it wrong um and if i were to do it again i would go out and talk to 100 people um and say hey have you ever heard of investing in wine um do you know anybody who invests in wine what are your investing habits you know are you invested in any sort of alternative assets um why do you invest in these things and really understanding uh, your 
target customer's uh, psychology, I think is one of the most important things when you are starting a business, far more important than the 10 steps that the SBA lists when it comes to to starting a business. Because ultimately, um, you you have no business if you have no customers. So trying to de-risk that um, at the start, I think is the appropriate approach when it comes to entrepreneurship. I guess the interesting thought experiment that comes out of that is if you had done that, do you think you would have started Vint? Because in some ways, right, you, you started something that is was maybe not in people's mind of an asset class. So I, I, I question, I wonder if, if thinking back on that time, if you had started there and you know, you talked to 100 people and only two people had ever thought of it. I wonder if that would have been, you know, a reason for you not to start the company. It, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, because this, and what I just described is um, this thing called customer dis- discovery. And it's always centered around this like problem solution dynamic, which when I was introduced to this concept, you know, I, I struggled with it because I was like, what's really the problem here? There's a lot of different ways that someone could diversify their portfolio. Um, and, you know, most people, as you, you you just mentioned, maybe only two people will have heard about wine investing and they might have the problem that, oh, it's, um, it's really high minimums. Uh, it's a really inefficient, opaque market. Um, so... I, I think it's a great question. I don't know if I could tell you that, oh, if I had talked to 100 people and 98 people said, oh, I've never heard of this, it would have changed the outcome of, of where we are today. Um, but, you know, with that, that being said, um, there's a lot that can be learned through that process about someone who you view to be your, your, possible, um, your possible customer. So um, nothing about entrepreneurship is, um, I, I feel like there's always two sides to the coin. Um, I, I've described, you know, when I talk to fellow founders that I could be telling you something, but you might talk to someone right after me and they're going to tell you something totally different. N- neither is right or wrong. And you have to ultimately figure out with all of this information, like what is the best process? Um, so I wish that I had talked to those hundred people because I think it would have helped inform um, the very initial product, the minimum viable product, which for us, we spent about nine months working with the SEC to establish a, a securitization structure. If I had gone out and talked to a hundred people, I think something could have been done with an Excel sheet and Gmail um, to test it out as opposed to um, what was a, an expensive and, and long process. So um, yeah, but that was a great question. Thank you. So um, you know, we kind of dove in without even describing what Vint is. I just thought like establishing that framework of, of like what, of how to start a business versus, you know, how to, you know, how people are taught would be an interesting uh, kind of jumping off point for understanding what Vint is. So I would say the concept and the vision for Vint are are certainly unique. Maybe you can help explain or give a high level overview of Vint before we dive into the various products um, and kind of the market that you're trying to, um, I guess, exploit and, and, and find arbitrage opportunities within. Absolutely. Um, Vince is a wine and spirits platform that combines investment products with a direct consumer marketplace. So what that means is on the investment side, investors, uh, retail institutional investors can get uh, exposure to this asset class, which is tangible bottles or casks of fine wine and rare spirits which have a track record of appreciating. There was a study done by a professor at Cambridge that looked at fine wine returns from 1900 to 2012. And and it exhibited equity like returns about eight and a half percent annually with very low correlation to traditional financial assets. 
So when you think about the value proposition there, um, it is this long term, uh, historically appreciating asset class that um, is a highly inefficient market, which is what drew me to the asset class was the the economic inefficiency, which which we'll touch on. But before we get into that, we combine that investment business with a direct to consumer marketplace. So you have investors um, buying interest in a fund that owns wine and spirits. Uh, ultimately, we have to sell those, and we created our own direct to consumer marketplace here in the U.S. because the price at which these assets trade at direct to consumer in the U.S. is at a premium to other markets. You know, people have asked, "Why don't you sell through auction houses or other merchants?" Ultimately, we're going to sell the assets wherever we get the best price. We've just seen that owning the marketplace and eliminating the transaction fees of other avenues is the best way to do it. So uh, those are the the two primary businesses that we have here and how they work together. And I know that you have from a very young age had this desire to exploit inefficiencies. And you mentioned how those inefficiencies exist within wine. Maybe you can talk about the types of inefficiencies that exist today. Sure. Um, I've, I've talked in the past about inefficient markets are, are very interesting. You, you learn in um, economic studies about the example of Royal Dutch Shell and Shell, two, uh, two equities that were trading at uh, different prices, yet were entitled to the exact same earnings. I've exhibited, I, I've seen that in the past, with, whether it's Pokemon cards, whether it's um, players on online exchanges uh, for a soccer video game and with wine and spirits. The thing that was most interesting to me when I was doing the wrong thing, writing this business plan was that I saw countless examples of wine, uh, the, the same exact bottle of wine that would trade for a thousand dollars in the UK, uh, $1,200 in the U S and $1,400 in the Asian markets. That was really, really interesting to me. Um, it, it felt a bit like equities markets may have been in the early 1900s, where uh, it was just uh, rampant with information asymmetry. Uh, a lot of people in this market, um, it, it's very antiquated. Um, one of the things that I say quite often is that my competitive advantage is that I have no background in the wine industry. And I'm also the least passionate person about wine and spirits on our business team, because we look at the market in a different way um, than other participants that are largely passion driven, uh, which I think has allowed us to um, not only notice these uh, inefficiencies, but also capitalize on it by owning each sort of uh, each part of the supply chain. So getting direct sourcing, um, building the uh, logistics infrastructure and then owning the marketplace. Uh, most people, if they were to do what we're doing as an individual, uh, you're going to pay higher prices to buy the wines and then you're going to pay higher transaction fees when you're selling the wine, which you know, it creates that parity across regions. But if you can build that all yourself, that's where it unlocks the um, the arbitrage opportunities. And I would assume that there are some structural reasons for why these inefficiencies persist. What? Why would a, the same bottle of wine trade? You know, for fourteen hundred versus a thousand um, in different markets, and why would that? Why would like what's what? Why wouldn't that just close over time in, in your, from your perspective? Um, chances are it will compress over time. Um, I think we're going to be a driver behind that because we're going to get so big that it will compress. But ultimately, you do have costs associated with transportation, with storage, with having five layers of middlemen across you know you have the producer and, and this is the the region of bordeaux but you have the producer you have a negotiant um you have um merchants 
you have an importer and then you have a retailer when you have all of those different layers um you have these inefficiencies it's if you can cut some of those out or own them that creates that opportunity the Bordeaux system has been in place for hundreds of years so I don't think it's going to really change but if you can um build and own part of it that's where I think despite what I view a big opportunity to be is just to really own the market I think we will not totally we will not totally eliminate the mispricings across the market because some really the the number of middlemen create the structural mispricings and in terms of the core investment product how would you frame the investment opportunity and where an investment in wine security fits within a portfolio with some you know either high net high net worth individual or institution like where where would you place uh some the, the rationale for some allocation to wine and spirits Sure. Um, a, a quick history on the products that we've offered to um, to lend some context here. So, our we've done about a hundred different offerings to to investors. Um, I mentioned a nine month process with uh, the SEC uh, that was under Regulation A plus, which allowed us to offer uh, thematic collections to both accredited and non-accredited investors. Um, the paperwork is a, a Form 1A. It reads very similar to an S1. It's like an IPO light, um, which unlocked a really broad market. Um, these were pretty narrow in scope. It could be a single bottle of you know, McAllen, 78-year-old, that was $130,000. It could be uh, a Bordeaux regional uh, offering focused on the 2010 vintage. Um, that was our structure that we began with. Um, it gave investors the ability to pick and choose and build this diversified portfolio within wine and spirit to add to their broader portfolio. A lot of investors, and, and I think uh, we, we were early in you know 2019 when we started working on this, but in 2022, 2023, you saw people like Goldman, people like KKR really emphasizing the, uh, the benefits of alternatives. And I think KKR recommended a 40, 30, 30 portfolio, um, uh, a divergence from the 60, 40. So, um, we, we started with those products and where we are today is larger diversified offerings. People can cut one check um, and this is targeted at higher net worth individuals, uh, family offices, RIAs, the broker dealer channel and be instantly diversified. Um, where an offering like that fits into someone's portfolio, what we like to talk about in terms of, of the benefits here, there are a few prongs. One is the lack of correlation. Uh, two Sigma ran a study showing about 0.15 correlation to uh, the S&P um, across the wine uh, investment landscape. There's an index out there, the LiveX 100 or LiveX 1000, which tracks investment grade wines. And that's what we look to benchmark off of as well. So you have this asset class that has a low correlation that has exhibited downside protection. In 2008, it was basically flat. 2022, in a pretty volatile market, um, wine experienced uh, a lot of strength, about 22%. Um, additionally, I would say we compound that downside protection by buying assets below their intrinsic value. When you can buy them for 1,000 in the UK and you can bring them into the US, for call it fifty dollars, and that uh, that asset trades at twelve hundred dollars, you have a pretty substantial margin of safety compounding that downside protection. And then, lastly, and this is a a rather new development, but one thing that we had been asked about are what are tax benefits with this investment? Um, it, 
And I think I underappreciated how much people really value any sort of tax benefits. So one thing that we've done, um, we have a large offering that we're going to market with that actually has the potential to be um, viewed under the qualified small business exemption, um, which effectively means uh, after five years, distributions are um, exempt from federal taxes. It is a highly complex rule, so I would defer to um, individuals, tax professionals to learn more about it. But those are um, the, the three sort of portfolio benefits, the lack of correlation, downside protection, uh, and this, this long-term uh, potential tax benefit. Obviously, we will um, talk about returns as well. But in terms of differentiated benefit, those are the three that we point to. And one of the things I'm curious about is like how you're putting together these collections. Some are called, like if I look through your, your website, some kind of have like a, um, some are called arbitrage, some are called regional. I'm, who's, who and who and how are you putting together collections um, to give people like obviously you want to give people a choice, but I'm trying to think, I'm trying to understand how the sausage is made there and the differences in, in, you know, something like what would be the difference between arbitrage and a regional play? Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a great question to ask. I just said that I am not passionate about wine and spirits and have no background in the industry. So um, why should you be be picking wines and spirits to be invested in and the answer is i don't do that um i brought, brought on great talent um so our coo his name is adam lapierre he's one of uh, about 60 masters of wine here in the u.s it's uh it's about as deep as you can get into wine and the business of wine a lot of people are familiar with the, the master psalm um driven by the, the the psalm movies um that's more focused on service the master of wine is focused on the business of wine and Adam is a highly data driven individual. So the, the way that the sausage is made, and I'm going to reference this, this offering that we're going to market with right now, it's a $10 million offering. The, um, the thesis is 75% wine, 25% spirits blended across Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, Italy, the rest of the world on the wine side, and then across Scotch, Japan, and other spirits. When we're going to source these assets, one thing that we've built is, uh, it's almost like a Bloomberg terminal for wine and spirits. So we're taking in a ton of data from across different markets, the UK market, the auction market, the US uh, markets, and we take a true value investment approach. If there's anything that I have imparted upon the team that does the sourcing is this value investing mentality of sourcing assets at a margin of safety. So a lot of time, a lot of the time what we're doing is there's a general screen of based on you know, brand, historic returns, critic scores, uh, which filters out the vast majority of wines that are not investment grade. And then within that screen, we're looking for value opportunities where assets are trading um, at a discount to what we view their intrinsic value to be. Um, so we really are value buyers, but diversify across um, a large number of, of regions of vintages um, so that, you know, our view is that if we can be, broadly diversified across all of those things, we are um, decreasing the general risk of this asset class because there have been times it goes up, there have been times that it goes down, but if we can be split across regions, vintages, and even wine and spirits, that's our best way to, um, I guess, generate the best risk adjusted returns. And I think one thing that comes up anytime you're thinking about or portfolio construction and asset allocation is a scalability of any asset class, right? Like you know, there has to be for, especially for a high net worth individual or maybe an institution, there needs to be enough liquidity, you know, just enough dollars that you can put into the market for it to make sense. So you talk about 
a $10 million offering. How scalable do you think this can be? Is that is that the top end of how much you could potentially do in an offering? Or could, you know, assuming you have the working capital to figure it out, could you go even bigger than that? We can. And this is a question that I used to struggle to answer because um, the market's very opaque. Um, you have what is listed each year in terms of primary offerings, uh, so new vintages. But you also have this secondary market, which we'll, we participate in. You have aging whiskey that is investable. Um, so I, I've struggled to answer that, but I think the best way that I could describe the scalability of this asset class is to uh, refer to a comp in the UK. There's a business out there um, called Barry Brothers and Rudd. Um, they've been around a very long time, uh, like over 300 years. Um, they manage 1.3 billion in wine and spirits and have their own marketplace, which they um, exit a lot of those through. So they turn over um, 250 to 300 million a year um, through that marketplace. So you think about that from a, just like a portfolio perspective, it's about a four year hold on their entire portfolio with that turnover volume. Um, the really interesting thing is nobody thinks of that as an investment business. They think of it just as a wine merchant. But what's really happening is that they have a ton of clients who own this wine um, and it enables them to have a really broad variety of inventory without actually having to raise, you know, a billion dollars of equity capital to own that inventory. It's investors who have um, medium to long-term capital. Um, so I, I might be one of the few people out there who think about their business. I don't even know if they think about it as an investment business, but if you peel back a few layers, that is what it is. And that's where I think we can grow to is, um, in that billion dollar range where we're turning over, you know, that portfolio every four years. And you talked about turnover and, and, you know, kind of the whole period. When I was reviewing your materials, I saw the whole period on a number of these products that have already been introduced was kind of like short to medium term. I guess I kind of had it in my mind that like you, the idea was to, whatever, buy a wine and hold it. Like, it's just like a, whatever, over, over 20 years is going to appreciate at that rate, that eight and a half percent rate. And it's a compounding aspect. Um, so I'm just trying to get a sense of, um, why, and, and I know that's not all you're doing, but I'm trying to get a sense of, of like when something gets sold within nine months, per, for example, like what's, what's that, what's that coming from? And is that, is that the ideal situation or are there other products or strategies where it would be more of like a buy and hold? Yeah, so our strategies um, combine that buy and hold with also looking for the, you know, the short term mispricing. So one reason that we would sell an asset in nine months uh, is we receive an offer that we view to be above the fair market value of the asset. Um, we did a, a cask offering. Uh, this was for the, the, the retail investors and I believe the, the hold period was um, right around a year generated about a 36% IRR on that offering. And we decided to sell then because the offer that we got for that asset was um, pretty materially above what we viewed the fair market value to be leading to a quicker, a quicker turnover. Um, the, the reality is people especially for us as a newer asset manager want some sort of feedback and we look at these shorter term arbitrage trades as a way to generate strong returns but also provide feedback to investors um that hey we're doing what we told you we were going to do we're finding assets that are trading below their intrinsic value and executing those trades and returning capital to investors. So um, we are, our portfolios or our upcoming fund now combines those two things. When we're going out to source, 
we may look at an asset and say, okay, this is um, call it a, uh, a, a cask of whiskey that is 13 years old. Um, we know that casks of whiskey um, trade at a premium when they hit year 18. We're going to hold this for five years and sell it at year 18. Um, a lot of the assets that we're sourcing, we like to bring a thesis to that asset of, is it going to be more of this uh, short term kind of uh, arbitrage trade or is it going to be a long t- long term appreciating uh, asset? You've talked about both the opaqueness of this industry and the inefficiency, but also that at times there's some shady behavior in the wine industry. Maybe you can talk about the level of transparency you offer at Vint, at Vint and and why you think that's so valuable, especially within the wine space, wine and spirit space. Definitely. So you've had examples of fraud or people fake wine. There's a, a documentary maybe on Netflix called Sour Grapes about an individual who um, faked a lot of well-known uh, uh, wines, sold them through auction. Um You've had funds blow up and uh, really due to liquidity crunches um, where you've seen some businesses in the wine investment space focused exclusively on raising capital and not on the actual end sale channel. Um, I think that's actually a big risk of growing too fast is you raise too much capital, but you haven't focused on building the end sale or the marketplace and then um, when you structure your investment product with um, the ability for anybody to get liquidity at any time, you have a tremendous risk um, of a of a bank run, which you saw in you know early 2010 kind of time period. A few wine funds blow up, so um, you've had fraud. You've had just poor structuring. Uh, in, in our view, the offerings that we've structured have a three to seven year hold period, um, but they're illiquid. And a lot of people think, especially when they hear that at first, that that is a bug. In reality, our view is that it is a feature. It allows for that longer term hold. um, And it also actually tremendously decreases, if not totally gets rid of a bank run risk for our business, which um, other people have had in the past. So that's the structure side. When it comes to transparency and reporting, we provide annual audited financials. There's an inventory audit done each year. Um, I don't know of anybody else who has that level of transparency. Um, Our offering docs are 100 plus pages, we very clearly describe, describe here's where the wines are stored, here's how they're insured. Um, and having those annual audited financials is, um, you know, our view of how we can create trust. Because uh, ultimately, the goal here is for people to think about this as a true asset class, um, not just a novelty, but a financial asset class right next to um, hedge funds, right next to private equity, right next to real estate in terms of their portfolio and doing those things um, from a trust and transparency perspective, I think increase the odds that people will think about this asset class in that way. You've already talked pretty extensively about the value of the marketplace. Maybe you could tell us where you are in that marketplace building process so far, and then where you hope you can take that marketplace over time um, and maybe talk about the, maybe just make sure everyone understands the synergistic, um, how the synergies between having the investment product and the marketplace. Definitely. One of the problems with marketplace businesses that make them challenging is this cold start problem. How do I get demand if I don't have supply? How do I get supply if I don't have demand? Um, On our investment side, we have, um, over $10 million invested across a host of the best wines and spirits across the world. Um, we launched the marketplace about eight months ago um, to get be- basically to generate better returns for investors because we had been trading on different exchanges and were paying um, transaction fees and thought, okay, let's, let's you know, be a vertical enterprise to improve returns. 
So with that, and over the past, we, we've been working on licensing structure here in the U.S. Um, we've decided to combine um, two very opaque uh, uh, parts of the law, which is securities law and alcohol law, which I think is our moat that we've done years of work. But we got the licensing set up for us to to own the marketplace where we could sell the investment assets and then in addition to that, work with other merchants to list their wines on on our marketplace. So we started off with a, a Squarespace site, and it was just a effectively a list of wines. It was um, you, you can see the the influence of how I started Vint and the mistakes that were made and the changes that were made when we started the Vint marketplace. It was a list of wines. People could look at that list and they had to email us if they wanted to buy it. It was uh, a very high friction process. But in month one, we did $15,000 in sales. Month two, we did $45,000 in sales. Month three, we did $100,000 in sales. And it was um, this clear, clear product market fit that people want these wines at the prices that we're offering them at and with our great selection. So we invested resources to build a platform behind it. Um, think of it sort of the, the eBay or StockX for wine, but more managed because of the law in the US, um, you, you need more intermediary management because um, there's no way to sell consumer to consumer in the US for alcohol. So um, we, we've taken the investment assets and, and used that as as the supply side, as well as merchants and are expanding into to collectors as well to run this managed marketplace business that um, is only eight months old, but has so much opportunity because right now when people go to buy wine and spirits online, uh, most people take the same path, which they go to this, uh, this vertical search engine called Wine Searcher, and they'll type in the wine that they want. They're taken to, you know, 15 different listings, and they'll look through and, you know, typically buy one of the three lowest priced wines from someone that they um, probably have shopped with before. Um, if they're going to buy multiple wines, they end up going and buying wines from five or six different platforms. Um, I don't go to five or six different grocery stores. When I'm going to buy my groceries, I go to one. Um, where I think the businesses get very interesting is I've been thinking a lot, listen to the, the Bezos interview when he did his podcast and the, the three things that don't change are people want a broad selection, they want competitive prices and they want fast delivery. No one's been able to offer that in the wine market because they use their balance sheet to fund inventory. For us, we have a very, very unique way to fund inventory um, in the, such that our view is that we could offer every single wine and spirit that somebody could want at a competitive price by leveraging the investment business to source the assets. And um, now you don't, don't go to wine search or you just go to Vint because we have it all and you know that it's going to be priced fairly. So that's where the two um, work together and unlock this really large opportunity. And you've talked about getting so big in the marketplace that maybe it becomes somewhat self-defeating on the investment business because you're closing the spread so I'm, I'm trying to understand how you think about that in certain areas. Like I just think of like the online travel agencies where um, over time as Expedia and booking got bigger and bigger, the margins and things like air travel got super slim because that ARB got uh, competed away. Price discovery improved. It was really good for the consumer and it was good for the winner take all, you know, in that market. How, how do you think about the tension between the platform and the, and the investing business and, and how you balance that maybe some, some of, to some, to some degree that the, the, the platform growth is self-defeating when it comes to the investment side. It's certainly something that, that I've thought about. And once again, it, it's a really good 
question that a few people have asked when they're thinking, you know, really big picture, where, where can these businesses grow to? Um, right now, the margins are, are pretty wide. Um, well, d- um, disclose them publicly, but they are pretty wide, giving us, you know, quite, <laughs> quite a large uh room to run when it comes to compression um for us our view is that we need to be as efficient as possible um adam who runs the marketplace business um has a background at at Lidl and um i think brings that efficiency mindset to the marketplace where um we we need to continue to source supply at good prices but we need to be very very efficient um we need to be the most efficient to keep our you know our margins strong so there there is likely a point in time where um compression happens um when that happens i'm i'm not sure but by being operationally very efficient and also one possibility to keep the the spreads wide thereby generating strong investment returns is if we can get closer to the source so right now um sometimes we source direct from the producer but a lot of times you have to have that relationship or you have to be um a a long-standing customer to get direct from the source so my view is that Although we may increase and compress some of this spread um, just by being quite large, that may unlock additional opportunities to buy wine at lower prices. I don't, I don't want to bet that we can continue to charge, um, you know, above market prices. Um, I want to make the bet that we're going to source wines at lower prices and be creative in how we do that to keep this spread. In the meantime, my guess is that the marketplace provides you with great data on pricing that could be used elsewhere. How are you using that data today? Yes, it's a very very interesting externality that has been developing through this business is right now the three primary data sources that we look at um, is an exchange in the UK, um, an auction aggregator, and then a US retail aggregator. We're now generating first party data, which helps inform buying decisions. Um, The marketplace will continue to grow and it will create this, uh, this unfair advantage when it comes to sourcing the wines, because we will have daily data on what wines are people looking for. Um, and we can look at that over time and source you know, the, the assets that are trending in the, in the right direction, um, which is where the combination of these two businesses, it just gets more and more interesting over time. And we talk a lot about competitive advantages on this podcast, given that you've gone through the SEC regulatory process to help make wine a financial asset class. It occurred to me that you might have a first mover advantage in conjunction with some barriers to entry. How do you think about your competitive position? Yes. um, It took nine months up front, another three to six months um, of, work with FINRA to um, create the securitization structure, uh, which has created trust. It's taken two and a half years to get the wine and spirits licensing um, sorted. And that continues to be a a work in progress as we look to expand into additional states and improve that structure. I I view the competitive advantage to be we have spent all this time, money um, and, and energy into creating the regulatory framework to do this. Um, You have wine shops, you have wine investment businesses, but combining the two um, and that regulatory structure is the the competitive advantage. 
I think I'd add there's this data advantage that is growing as we generate more first party data and then a manager advantage. I, I truly believe Adam is um, one of the best people in the world to be sourcing these assets. And, you know, 25 years of experience in the industry it was the president of a, a large wine trading firm in Napa prior to joining us. Uh, so the regulatory moat, the, um, the growing data advantage and then a, man, a manager advantage um, uh, creates what I view to be a pretty strong competitive advantage for a business that is, uh, you know, four years old. Going the other way, it also occurred to me that for the idea of wine as an asset class to proliferate, you almost want some other players to enter into the market to validate the concept. I think of something like REITs which were not really an asset class until there were enough REITs that people could put money to work there. How would you respond to that idea that some level of competition might validate the asset class? I think that's a, a very fair point. Um, we loop ourselves into, um, into art as well as this uh, tangible collectible asset class uh, a lot of times you see art and wine next to each other in these in these studies and I, I think a, a great comp for us is this business masterworks um, which is approaching a billion dollars in assets under management in the art space they um, started with the the securitization structure similar to us and have and they've done about 400 offerings um, one thing that I've found to be very helpful in any form of raising capital, whether it's raising venture capital or it's investors investing into wine, is um, the X for Y analogy. We are masterworks for wine. It clicks for people, um, whether it's on the whether w whichever form of capital it is, people tend to understand that. And that's something that we tested out in the early days of like, how can we classify wines um, so that it it clicks with people? And this this was never fully rolled out, but had worked on a Morningstar esque matrix for wines of you know um, looking at wines on a price to score ratio, looking at emerging markets, trending markets, and blue chips as a way to. Uh, you know, take that belief that I have that uh, it really helps people understand something when you say this is X for Y. So uh, unfortunately, that was never really rolled out. But I, I think you're exactly right, that one of the biggest challenges is education. If there's more people out there educating investors on this asset class, it will continue to to grow in terms of uh, the, the financialization because as I said, the goal here is for people to think about it like any other alternative asset class, not just a, a um, you know, not just a place people want to throw fun money because the first thing that dries up uh, is fun money. But what doesn't dry up is uh, an asset class that um, investors view as a portfolio diversifier that they're going to allocate, you know, single digit percentages to each year. In that response, you mentioned raising capital from VCs. Vince, uh, sorry, Vint was able to raise money from a few different venture funds. I'm curious about where you're focusing your investing efforts today as you put that capital to work. Yeah, so we've raised about seven million in venture funding. Our last round was a five million dollar round in um, October of of 2022. The focus now is capital efficient growth. Um, in 2021, uh, it, it was an environment where, um, you know, it was go out, raise a seed round, you'll raise a series A nine months later, a series B nine months later, and you had this, um, you know, assembly line of capital raising, and it was growth at all costs. Um, I never really took that mindset. We've always set reasonable valuations have thought about how can we take $5 million and turn it into, you know, 15, 20, $30 million of enterprise value. 
And our view in terms of where to invest to create that enterprise value, it's behind data, it's behind the growth of the marketplace, and it's behind intermediary distribution. Intermediary distribution for the investment business will add another layer to this moat where if we're um, on the big online platforms, if we're uh, on the custodians, if we're working with self-directed IRA platforms, um, broker dealers, uh, all of that stuff is time consuming, requires capital. And that's where we're focused on the investment side. Um, on the on the marketplace side, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Um, we've grown this. Um, we've grown this business with only a few people. Um, there's been no real sales efforts. So adding on the sales side there, building some um, additional technology on the operational front. Um, as, as you can imagine, I've mentioned how um, antiquated this this market is. So we're combining a number of different old systems to you know track orders uh facilitate logistics so building that internally and then also investing more behind the data side we view those three areas as highly valued creative areas to invest um, we have an additional um we have an additional business that we're testing which is working capital financing for producers uh inspired by the collapse of SVB and First Republic, who are the the two largest providers of capital in this space, um, we thought it would be interesting to use our brand, our our relationships, but also our data and understanding of this industry to offer financial products. Still very new, um, but um, another area of investment that you know, if this business shows growth like the marketplace has it's an area we will continue to reinvest behind one of the most interesting things about you is that you worked on the buy side at a value shop before starting vent you talk about capital efficient growth you talk about margin safety you speak the language of a value investor i'm curious about how your experiences researching and interacting with public companies has influenced your strategy and your the way you view building vent Um, it was a great job on the buy side. Um, uh, my, my team was great, very smart individuals. I, I got to read and learn all day, which I think is quite unique. Uh, a lot of times it's, you know, build these models, PowerPoints, Word docs, um, make sure everything's formatted nicely. A lot of my work that was done was spend five days reading, condense what you've read into three pages um, for us to understand. Um, the benefit that that job, as well as a lot of reading, I think I've, I've learned the most just from reading books, uh, has um, th the benefits that I've received from that is um just a, a general understanding of different ways to operate businesses, how businesses work. And um, for me, you know, I think a lot of founders, uh, they observe a problem and they, they go out and solve it. They're very product minded. They're uh, an engineer. For me, I, I understand how every single financial statement works, all of that within our business um, and um, the value investing side of things uh, has certainly contributed to that. Um, additionally, that long term mindset that I think a lot of value investors take, um, you know, especially Buffett has contributed not only to our philosophy when it comes to investing in wine and spirits, but also the philosophy that led us to spend nine months with the SEC, that led us to spend two and a half years with um, various state alcohol regulators to build a structure that was you know, built to last um, and uh, do it 
right from the get-go um, because we're trying to build a big business and we need to think over the long term um, to do so. I know that you say that you're not passionate about wine. In fact, in a recent letter, you wrote that passion fosters complacency. I think that's a very counterintuitive idea to some people. Can you explain why you think that's the case and what that opens up in terms of opportunities for Vint within the wine and spirit space? Definitely. From the investing side of things, um, we have peers out there and their um, CEOs and founders are, you know, publicly passed passionate about about wine and spirits you have merchants who have small investment programs um and a lot of times my view is that some of those smaller programs it's oh i tried this wine i liked this wine and you should invest in it because i liked it it's a, a highly biased approach additionally on the, the merchant front you have a lot of businesses who have been around for 20 30 years they love their job they love wine. Um, that <laughs> um, one could say it's a bit of innovators dilemma, but I think it's just passion about what they're doing. They're highly content and they're okay to just keep things going how they're going and don't necessarily think about innovating. So that's on the investment in the merchant side. Uh, another lens that I look at this through is um, on the producer front. When I wrote this letter, I was, uh, actually a little nervous to send it to um, some some friends who who are wine producers um, because I, I called out a lot of people do this out of a passion. It's a passion project. And what ends up happening is they end up sinking more and more capital into the business. It keeps losing money. It's it, this highly risky endeavor where they end up living vintage to vintage, not knowing um, how they're going to manage that cash flow. And I, I talk about other mechanisms that have been used in different industries to manage cash flow, such as working capital financing. Um, that letter was actually quite well received by those producers of, I actually feel this, you know, why, why can't we do things better? And it's because a lot of people who control how this industry evolves, um, you know, it's just out of a passion and they want to keep it how it is. So um, this um, dispassion for it. Um, let, let me clarify. I love building businesses, love markets. Um, but I think just looking at it um, through that lens, we can create solutions to these problems that people who are passionate about it might just ignore. And if we're having this conversation three years from now, and you have not realized some of your goals and your vision, what do you think will have gone wrong? We will have failed to educate enough people about wine and spirits as a financial asset class. Um, that is the, the biggest risk in my view over the next three years is that it remains this novelty where you know i'll put my fun money into this asset class but um if we are unable to educate people and crack intermediary distribution um then you know we we won't be able to achieve that growth on the marketplace side which more capital more inventory more growth that flywheel effect um, I'm, I'm highly confident that the marketplace will continue to to grow if we continue to increase supply. So that's why a big focus is on this this intermediary distribution. We've um, we've done the the track record building um, three years, strong returns, thousands of individual investors, but now it's time to cross that chasm. And um, that's if we're sitting here three years from now, Ben, and uh, we've been un unable to do that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I would, you know, I think we're very resilient and we'll find ways to figure it out. But um, that's the thing that we really need to figure out. On a more positive note, 
if we're sitting here in seven years, because I know you're a long-term oriented guy, uh, and we're talking and it has been successful, what would that success look like to you? We will have created the, um, the one-stop shop um, that is managing a billion dollars of wine and spirits and, and turning over, you know, 250 million a year, very similar to what Barry Brothers has done in the UK. And I think the, uh, the result of that is the auction houses would be much smaller than Vint and they would no longer be charging 30% transaction fees. So, um, taking that business and, and, and owning it and really being, um, changing the way it works here in the U S um, because it is um, highly inefficient today. And I can't let you go without diving into one other framework. Um, I think one thing that was interesting about you versus like so many entrepreneurs and, and people who are starting businesses is that you, you know, you're grounded in financials and the philosophy of investing, but you also are you know, highly conversant in different frameworks. So you, you've talked about in other venues the difference between effectual and causal reasoning. Maybe you can talk about the the, the differences there um, and why that's so relevant to you. Definitely. Eighteen months ago, a paper was shared with me. Uh, I believe it's titled um, "What Makes Entrepreneurs Entrepreneurial." Um, it has been a um, a frame breaking paper for me. I, I think I've I've referenced it dozens of times. I wrote a quarterly letter about it, um, and it, it does relate highly to how we opened this conversation um, about how people do things in entrepreneurship. A lot of times, they're taught to do things the wrong way, and that could be grounded in this concept of causal reasoning. Um, which is, um, I'm going to create this five-year plan step-by-step. I'm going to go out and execute what is on this plan. Um, effectual entrepreneurship is, uh, the, the opposite of that, where you have this concept of an end state, but you acknowledge that you don't know how you're going to get there. New things happen you adjust, you um, reforecast how you're going to get there. um, And you remain highly nimble and and flexible while having this idea, but taking the inputs that come in over time and adjusting your path to to get there. Um, And I've, one thing that is required with that is just a, um, I guess, a fortitude to handle uncertainty um, and acknowledging that this is a highly uncertain journey, um, but you have to kind of trust that process in a way um, that um, you you have to remain flexible and you have this, this idea of an end state, but um, how you get there, I don't know. And I'm certainly comfortable to admit that um, I don't know how we'll we'll get to this end state that I described seven years from now, but I, I'm certain that there will be ups and downs um, across that time period. But continuing to try and prove uh, every day is, is what we can do to uh, to increase the odds that we get there. Um, so that that paper. Um, it, 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 tru- truly frame breaking. And when I was reading, I was like, okay, this is how I think about it. And I was like, I, I don't know if I'm thinking about things the right way or the wrong way. And um, it, it really resonated with me. I think it's a great way to bookend this conversation. We start with your contrarian streak. And um, there's also some contrarianism built into that, uh, that, that um, framework as well. Um, so I like that. And so we'll close with the uh, question we always ask our founders and CEOs. What do you think is the most misunderstood aspect of the opportunity Vint has in front of it? Yeah, the most misunderstood part of our business 
is the scale question that you asked. A lot of people think, okay, this is a nice place that you can go out and deploy, you know, tens of millions of dollars into. When in reality, you just have to flip your flip the switch and look at the UK at a number of these merchants who have hundreds of millions or um, over a billion dollars of client reserves. If you switch that term to assets under management, um, you start to understand what this business can be over the long term when you you flip that switch. Wonderful. Well, um, I am excited to see. Uh, where this goes over time, because I, uh, as you, when we first spoke, I, I, I really got it pretty quickly. I think the synergies between the marketplace and the uh, and the financial product, and it occurs to me that in, you at, at some point the marketplace may be <laughs> much much larger than the financial um, the financial side, and and you talk about not knowing how you're going to get there. Maybe that's going to be the you know kind of the the the, the alternative path that maybe wasn't even on your radar when you first started. So um, thanks for sharing. Um, and I'd love to do this again, you know, in a few years to get an update on, on, on where you guys have been uh, successful. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ben.